runs around here and there. But once you serve the mind a proper meal, it will be like a very well-trained shepherd. It will keep coming back, keep coming back. It will anticipate, like Pavlovian reaction. What, I, what am I saying is here, that we usually doubt everything, but not our own mind. It's almost like I'm inviting you to use, and in this retreat, as a part strategy of this retreat, a lot of the opposite examples will be introduced, literally. A reverse perspective. If, we, if you remember, we already have spoken when I said to wear your jumper inside out. Mm -hmm. Reverse perspective is helpful. It gives a dimension seldom viewed. We did that in Italy when we talked about uh, different states of consciousness, you know, and to establish the validity of each of them rather than only this is real, other ones are just like imaginary ones. Yeah. What's the perspective? The other ones are subtle. And then in relation to Turiya, remember? We talked about it in relation to Turiya. Mm -hmm. So we reversed the whole thing. We reversed the whole thing and perceived and spoke about the relative states from the perspective of Turiya rather than from the perspective of the waking. Right. The perspective of the waking is the perspective of the Maya. Only the perspective of the Turiya can give us glimpses into this reality. But if we apply this perspective as the perspective, then it's already disturbed, distorted, and already gives us not what it is. Because it's a waking state of consciousness. And we kind of take it for granted. You see? And we apply even that understanding. Earlier you have spoken to um, Danet, and uh, kind of like I overheard that there is a lot of me in human experience. Mm -hmm. Tell me what isn't. Indeed, yeah. What isn't? What isn't me in human experience? If there was anything that is not me in human experience, then it's no longer human. It's left. That's like the shoes left outside, or, you know. So. This, this doubts will continuously rise, continuously. You will experience the wave, sattvic wave, your practice will be spontaneous and, su and sudden, involuntary, and there will be a lot of joy in it. You sit down to meditate, there's joy, it will be in a sattvic phase. But that sattvic phase bound to wane down because you don't have yet enough of that. So you will expand it, like you spend money, you know, like you spend anything. And then there will be a rajasic phase. A rajasic phase when you will feel agitated, for instance, agitated. And then you will get tired and the tamasic state will come. And you will have a tamasic phase in your sadhana, in your meditation, where each time you sit down, it's like, the last thing I want is to meditate. And you know that this is as simple as that. <laughs> However, if you give in to that, if you give in to that, you only increase the duration because tamas should be crushed down, crushed down, like the demons have to be destroyed. Come on, I have to now go to the level of speaking from the point of view of lore and deconstruct and show you who are the demons. You read all the scriptures, your lores, the stories, myths, this, that. Demons are this. Demons is sense of inertia. Feeling of inertia, this is what demons are. Nothing other, otherwise demo, demonic about it. It's that. It's what obscures our own light. Temporarily makes everything heavy. It's that what we call demonic in quality. It's tamasic, heavy. It's as simple as that. So it tempts us away. It uh, loses us away. Sadhana by nature is something you commit to. And that commitment is almost has an air of I give examples, for instance, for you. What the heck? I mean, why would Mstislav Rostropovich, at the end of his career, when there were only a few years left for him to live, celebrated, I mean, most celebrated musician of his time? Already spoke about that. Three greatest composers wrote for him to perform. Can you imagine? Composers wrote pieces in view of the performer. Who wrote for him? Do you know who wrote for Mstislav Rostropovich? 
Elgar, Schnitke, and uh, Russian composer Shostakovich. Dmitry Shostakovich wrote for him. Edgar Elgar wrote for him. And Alfred Schnitke, greatest composers of the 20th century, wrote for him to perform. And yet this old man in his apartment practices cello. Is he nuts or what? Or is it on autopilot? Is he a fanatic? Or gone out of it? He no longer even plays out in public. He conducts only. This is sadhana. This is kung fu. This is what you have to commit yourself. This is what we spoke earlier today. You have to commit not tomorrow, right at this moment. You know, yeah. You commit yourself. You don't longer, you do action for the sake of action. Action for the sake of action has tremendously purifying effect. It frees you from the debris. Otherwise, mind will take you on a spin, spin you and throw you out into the periphery of the stuff that you would not want to deal with because it's, it stinks, unpleasant. It's like a, you know, it's <laughs> and, uh, like an asshole of every city, you know? But there is something in the, in the maybe that is the nature of Tamasic, I don't know, because we were speaking also about the state when you witness what happens, you know, you know. And still, somehow, it feels as if you have no influence on, on Yes, you do. Yes, you do. For instance, again, there is this <coughs> story of Baron Münchhausen. If you know it or not. Münchhausen? Yeah. I know he's a cla it's a classic kid's story, right? Yeah. And uh, full of wisdom. I mean, stop reading bullshit. Start reading kids' books. <laughs> All right, all these self-help books by PhDs and MDs. Read, read, classic lore of any culture. All is there. Classic lore, fairy tales, folklore. Yeah. Profound wisdom that stood the test of time. It's not written by so-and-so, it's a collective product. It's something that has been put together in writing probably after its existence for millennia. Mm -hmm. The guy essentially falls into the mire with his horse and witnessing that he is drowning there. Mm -hmm. So he is, of course, very clear-sighted and clear-minded. He realizes that I'm in a mire, and I am Baron Minhausen drowning now. And at this moment, I'm already up to my chest, and the horse is barely, barely alive, catching the last gulp of air. Very quickly, Baron Minhausen decides, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to drown here. Certainly not with my horse, or being on my horse. He grabs himself by his very powerful big mustache and pulls himself out of the mire <laughs> with the horse outside of it. <laughs> and then he rides away, see? And it's just one of the encounters of Baron Minhausen. He did many others. But that is showing to you that no, you cannot drown in the mire. In the mire, that mire or mire is the same. It's something that gallops you down. You take yourself by your own effort and you pull yourself and even save that horse you want to ride on later. <coughs> or a jackass, whatever you prefer to ride. You know, so you have to be practical about this. Okay? It's not enough just to witness that this is and then get on with it. At some point you have to be committed to it. You have to be committed to the level where you no longer give yourself any excuses. Because if you do, life will gobble you down, simply because I will remind you the grander perspective. In the grander perspective, or from the grander perspectives, because now there is an acceleration, it amounts for the acceleration of the negative force, because that's in the nature of things. Whenever sun is rising, shadows get long at some point. This acceleration of the awakening of the new, the so-called shift in paradigm and everything, is accompanied by tremendous regressive energy, mm -hmm. which opposes that. And you are right in the middle of that as a human being, because you are equipped with the most profound nervous system. Mm -hmm. And this is the Nietzsche string, this is the Nietzsche string, or the Vedic string, wherever you find yourself you know, plug that string, whatever sound it produces. This is the sound. This is we experiencing at every immersion. 
the release of the stress as well as the angelic voices from the same person, from the same being. This is what we're all living in the presence of. So when you're telling me that after a couple of two, three, four, whatever, I, I don't care how many weeks you drop the practice, how does that make me feel? How does that supposed to make me feel? You know, this, you have to commit to it. If I was teaching you some sacred arts here, let's say martial arts, for instance, then you will be kicked out with like with a big kick in the butt. Because, because that will not be on. Likewise, if you were practicing mu music for real, not because you're pay paying tuition fees and the teacher cares very little how, how you do, because as long as the fees are being paid. But if you are picked up by the teacher, right, then you will be given such a hard time for not practicing, because that is your duty. And any instrument, any instrument, we spoke about it, you want to enjoy tennis? Flip, you'll get tired from picking up the balls if you cannot practice. Anything you want to do, you have to have to overcome the physicality of it. Likewise, you have to come the physicality of your own physiology. You have to get on top of it. So I don't know what else you want to ask because I'm getting pissed off now. So just That's round it up. Perfect answer. Yes. And then, of course, it's like we want to have, you know, then excuses will rise immediately, you know, and this, this and that. And I will remind you, the sacrifice, the word sacrifice, there's no truth, there's no religion, there's no true spiritual practice without an aspect of sacrifice. When you sacrifice something into something else, a new quality is born, alchemical reaction. And what are you sacrificing? At this moment, only a bit of time. I'm not even saying you to sacrifice, lay down yourself. This is also skills, art. You have to learn to do that. There come a time when nothing else would do. But at the moment, just a bit of time. I knew people who work, and they would wake up early in the morning and do that before they go and do a full-time job. Very often the job which you would even be surprised how they can do it. We're all in a different situations in life and we will always find excuses. Always remember that. And life passes us by, you know, because in, in the excuses. Don't do this to yourself. Don't debase yourself, you know. And as an encouragement, you will see how, when you get on top of this, it's like something which felt rock solid melts, which something felt like sticky, viscous, like, like literally. No, it doesn't. It's like, uh, oh, I can do it. It's like that. Because you are your own consciousness. You are your own consciousness. Consciousness doesn't move, move with the speed of light. Speed of light comes out of consciousness if it wants to. Consciousness moves at the speed of consciousness. That's how quickly you can change things within. question but I had a very intense sadhana when I had a, still was in a full-time job and I was doing kundalini yoga in the beginning and I woke up literally for months at five o'clock and I did it for one and a half hour and I was really committed and um, I worked and then I so I yeah it was it was really I was it was into my life but then um, at a point I I felt like I wasn't living anymore. I felt like this. I'm I'm so tired and oh, blah, blah, blah. and okay, maybe that's the same excuses coming up. But it was after really months of commitment. So then I um, then I stopped 
not from the five o'clock I went to six six thirty so yeah I loosened it up but it, it speak about a very long time but still I'm in the same yeah may, you should not maybe put results on the sadhana but yeah it was just it is a bit confusing because it 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 hard it it was not I didn't enjoy it's not about enjoy but it was yeah, it seems like I, I I did that in a certain way and then that's what my first feeling was like, oh, but I don't have to do it every day because I did it and it was not, and it's not that I want to um, uh, compare it or, but still it reminded me of that and it's, um, yeah, it's no, not offending you or, or, or no, teaching No, I am not offended. Why, why should I be offended? It's just a question because I was there and I, I was really committed at that time that I, I, it didn't, it really, it was like, and I was so happy that I, in the beginning if, if it was also like, oh, I'm not doing it, and also should I do it, should worse thing happens now if I'm not doing my sadhana and all these brainwashing things, but, yeah. You have to decide for yourself. Daphne, I cannot... You see, this is where the part, this part is the tricky part. You need to decide, you know, and you're asking for guidance, you're asking for shedding the light, you're asking for, you know that we take things in life and we try, and it, like, okay, it doesn't work, uh, and we move on to the next thing. It's a, also a disease of our time. We never tr really tried anything long enough. Really never tried it. And how long did you say that was? Um, one year and a half. One year and a half? How long elephant gets, goes, goes pregnant? Elephant? Elephants. Two years. Two years. Two years. Even elephant is getting pregnant longer. You know, <laughs> imagine elephant suddenly. Uh, it's oh, too long. You know, <laughs> get out of here. I want to enjoy my life. Not that you're an elephant, of course. Don't get offended. But the story getting elephantal proportion, you see, is becoming elephant-like. Don't let that happen. I think it's it's this it's sometimes this feeling of helplessness not to know how to take yourself by the moustache, you know. You 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 witness that that it is your own that it that it is your tendencies and that it's your lack of commitment. And you see it's as you say it, you cannot your mind knows. You know? Maybe and still it feels like... Maybe there's always a choice what we want to identify with. You see? So yes, those are... I, I'm, 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 I'm ill in the same bed, we say in my language. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm also struggling with that. But I'm, what I'm I, what curious I, what, about what the strength, the yeah. impulse, you know? What is, where, where comes the impulse from, that fire, that instead of feeling like submerged by it, knows about its power and takes itself by, by, the, by its own moustache? It's that power of tapas. Mm -hmm. It's that power of tapas. And power of tapas, that power of inner fire, can only be can only be sustained by pouring something into that fire. As soon as you stop putting something into the fire, it will sooner or later die. Don't we know that? Fire needs something so that it burns. Something, whatever. Something needs to be offered into this fire. And that is another understanding and also the deeper dimension of sadhana. 
It's that offering, it's your yagya. Everyone performs yagya. When you will ripen up to that understanding, tremendous shift will happen in your life. Yagya is literally a sacrificial offering because we need to sustain that fire. And that fire will in turn sustain us. And in turn the gods are happy. And in turn they will make us happy. And so forth. The, the old perspective. Valid then, valid now. It's just that. So, what in sustains fire, what keeps the fire burning, is the fact that something is offered into that fire. So your meditative practice is that, you're offering, constantly offering something into the fire, into that fire. Dhyana itself, meditation itself, is considered to be that. Because you're pouring, you're pouring mind into that which is the fire of Brahman. You're pouring the senses into that which is the fire of Brahman. You're pouring life force into the, that which is the fire of Brahman. And it is only that fire that sustains everything, no, no other. So reclaim the sacred. Don't be afraid. Don't become clinical about that. How you do it, it's your own way. You have to recreate that. You have to be able to recreate that. Hmm? I mean, from a really, really practical perspective also, like I did meditation daily for years and it never had the power that my meditation has now, because it didn't have, it didn't have shakti. So it may be that this is just different sadhana than what you were doing before. It's different than mine was, you know. So. Well, I wasn't even going there, you know. Like I didn't even want to go into like uh, that. Some many people did spiritual practices based on some structures and systems. And they get wary of that, get tired of that. And that kind of cast shadow on anything else that we've done after, or doing after. Because we always compare things. Things are always, it's a tendency to compare. But enough been said, I think. Hmm?